Over the past two months, my wife has resumed a close relationship with Helen, her sister. Before that, we used to see Helen and her not-so-smart husband once every three times a year. Now it had become weekly. Helen used the time we spent together to complain about her husband and the things he screwed up. It got me thinking about what my wife was saying about me. A needle and thread are not tools I normally use. My mom used them because she sewed quilts when I was a kid and thought it was good for me to learn too, even though I was a boy. Fast forward 30 years, and I found myself remembering how to use a needle and thread. From a small box, usually kept at the bottom of my toolbox, I pulled out a small device that looked like a little white button. It matched the other six buttons on the front of my wife's favorite silk blouse. With tiny scissors, I cut the original button off the blouse, removed all the threads from where the button had been, and sewed the device in place. I hung the blouse on a hanger and carried it into our bedroom, hanging it in its original place. I could hear the shower running in our bathroom. I quietly walked back to my home office and opened my laptop. Opening a new program and typing in a password, I displayed a picture of our bedroom. I played with the remote until I heard the sound of the shower and saw the bedroom clearly. I listened with my headphones on. I heard the shower turn off and the hairdryer turn on. A few minutes later, my naked wife walked into the bedroom and started getting dressed for dinner with her sister. I watched. She pulled on suspender stockings and a skirt. She put on low-heeled shoes. From the desk drawer, she pulled out a satin bra and started to put it on. She stopped and applied some perfume, then put the bra on. She put on a silk blouse. If she noticed the replaced button, it would only be when she touched it with her fingers. She didn't notice anything. The desire to find out what she and Helen had been talking about led me to learn more about my wife than I had realized. After buttoning her blouse, she sat down at the dressing table and busied herself with her face and hair. I watched. The camera in the button looked into the mirror and I saw everything. When she was ready, she looked at her watch, pulled a cell phone out of her purse, and dialed a speed dial number. Eight o'clock on the ocean front, outside by the front doors. She dialed a new speed dial number and said, Remember, you don't answer the phone at home until I call your cell phone. Thanks, sis. She tossed the phone in her purse and stood up. I pressed a few keys and iTunes and Dave Brubeck appeared on the screen. Lisa walked into my office and kissed me on the cheek. I took off my headphones and asked, When are you coming back? No later than 10.30. We all have to work tomorrow. Don't wait up for me. Okay, say hi to Helen for me. She nodded and waved as she left the house. I turned on the monitoring program again. She turned on the car radio and sang along to a song until she was almost at the beach. She parked and pulled her cell phone out of her purse, and I watched as she turned it on vibrate and tossed it back in her purse. If I hadn't suspected her, it would have been hilarious. I wanted to turn off the computer and not know what she was doing there, but I couldn't stop watching. She got out of the car and headed toward the restaurant on the edge of the pier. We'd never been there. She didn't go inside, but stood in the shadows from where she could watch the front doors. I looked at my watch. 7.58 p.m. My gaze caught movement on the screen. A man appeared from around the corner of the restaurant. He looked around and headed straight for Lisa. When he was ten feet away from me, I snapped a picture of him and turned on the recording. Is there any trouble? He asked. No. They both looked around and, seeing that no one could see them, kissed. They walked out onto the pier. As they walked, they talked. I adjusted the volume. Do you have a plan? Lisa asked. I think I do. The last time I saw Pete was a month ago. I weighed 190 pounds. Today I'm at 180. When it's 170, I'll have lunch with him and tell him I have cancer. She turned and looked at him. It's not dangerous. I could hear the worry in his voice. No. When I dial 160, he'll ask if there's anything you can do for me. Carelessly, I joke that he might let me sleep with you. If he goes for it, we're free. Once he let me have you, he gave permission, and that's the end of it. I think he'll allow it. He's very kind. He smiled. A dying man's last wish. They stopped in an almost dark part of the pier and kissed. His hands unbuttoned his blouse and moved the camera so I could no longer see what he was doing. Lisa was kind enough to comment. Bill, I love, but be careful. If you leave a mark, Pete will see it.
I'm not wearing panties, she whispered. Oh, God, Bill, easy. Yes, right here. We'll get a room somewhere next week. Can you take the afternoon off? We could go miles away and use the bed, Bill suggested. Tuesday. I can take Tuesday afternoon off. Then we'll have a couple hours and we can make nice again. He led her over to the picnic table and she sat on the edge. They heard a noise and Bill lowered her legs and turned away from the noise. Bill looked at his watch and started buttoning his blouse. Four more kisses and they walked back toward the restaurant. He turned left and disappeared. She walked past the restaurant and got into her car. On the way home, she chewed and swallowed six mints. When she turned onto Washington Avenue, I turned off my computer and went to bed. She came in and undressed in the bathroom. I heard the water running in the sink and then the toilet flushed. She came to bed wearing my t-shirt and panties. I pretended to sleep until she got into bed. Then I woke up and asked, How's Helen? She's fine. I think she's mad at Gordon, but she didn't want to talk about it. That's unusual. Angry at Gordon is all she talks about. She kissed me, rolled over on her other side and fell asleep. I almost threw up. That mouth kissed me after Bill. I lay awake for over an hour, pondering. When I woke up, Lisa had already showered and dressed for work. I had completed my ritual and was ready for the time we would walk out the door together. At every opportunity throughout the day, when I wasn't heavily focused on work, I thought about my wife and my best friend. This was the guy who supported me at our wedding. I needed a plan. I needed to know why they were doing this to me. Had I been such a bad friend, such a bad husband? Did I deserve this? At lunch, I sat with six other guys. Most of them were about my age. I told them I had been loaned a tape and the show was about a guy who found out his wife was cheating. The guy in the movie took his wife to a psychologist, and by the end of the show, they seemed to be fine. That opened up the discussion. I learned things about the guys I worked with for 10 years that I didn't know. I was already married to Beth once, John Kingsley said. Three years later, I found out she had been doing her boss for five years. The whole time we knew each other, she was sleeping with her boss. We never went to counseling. I found out on Wednesday, and I had an apartment over the weekend and moved out. He'd been married to Alice for five years, but the pain was still fresh and alive in his voice. Sitting across from him was Luis, the oldest on our team. He was 42. If she agreed to be faithful when you got married, the first time she cheats, you're no longer married. All bets are off. It's like sports. When the ball leaves the court, it's over. So you're going to divorce her? Kick her to the curb? He looked up again and said, Why do I need a piece of paper? She wants a divorce. She can pay for it. I left. The day after I find out my woman is involved with someone else, you won't see me here. I'll be gone. Hank spoke up. The church tells us to deal with it. They talk about forgiveness. Don't you want to know why? Does knowing the temperature of the ice change the way it feels? Louis asked. I nodded. Bob Thomas stood up. Lunch is over, he said. We all went back to work. I wondered, who cares why Lisa is sleeping with Bill? If a pipe in my house is clogged, I don't care why, I just want it fixed. If there's a fire in the house, do I take the time to find out what caused it? Heck no, I just want the fire out. All day long, I languished. Then I called Lisa's sister. I called her at work. She answered professionally, and when she found out it was me, her voice changed. Friendly, not professional. Helen, I need your help. Lisa's birthday is coming up, and I want to make it special. Why don't we sit down and work something out? I feel like I need help. I will. When? Can you be free Tuesday afternoon? I knew Lisa would be busy. Uh, sure. Where shall we meet? Any good restaurant near where you work? Quiet, well lit, and good food. Got it. How about on the beach? The restaurant is actually on the beach where the chairs are in the sand. That's great. Noon? I'll write it down. Don't write down lunch with Pete. If Lisa sees it, she'll find out and ruin the surprise. I'll put lunch with Sandy. She took ten minutes to tell me what her husband was up to. They'd been together two years longer than we had, and he'd messed up so many things that I was amazed how that man could walk across the room. And yet. Helen stayed. Something was keeping her in a relationship that clearly wasn't working. I volunteered to work on Saturday. Sunday I took care of the housework. In the back of my mind, I knew the house would soon be on the market. Lisa tried to talk me into going to the movies Sunday night. 
She wanted us to have dinner and go to a movie about an hour and a half away from the house. The same movie was playing at a theater less than 15 minutes away. When she told me what restaurant she wanted to go to, I knew it would be at least $30 for the entree, and she would want wine and dessert. I asked if it was her treat or mine. Nah. She decided we could stay home and watch something on cable. We stayed home and watched a movie on cable. It was called Breaking Up. When it was over, I asked, why would they get married? They were acting like two married people fighting over nothing and trying their best to ruin their own lives. Men don't know how to listen. She said it with a tone and body language that said what she said was more than an opinion. To her, it was a fact. There had to be some straight men who could listen, otherwise there would be 80% lesbians in the world. With the invention of silicone, I bet the percentage has gone up, Lisa said. If our marriage broke up, would you want to remarry me? She stopped. She was holding two empty Diet Coke cans and an empty popcorn bowl and was heading for the kitchen. She turned and asked, what oh? Answer my question. Lately, I've been getting the feeling that you're not happily married to me. If not, let's sell the house, split the money and kiss goodbye. Her eyes filled with tears. I thought you were happy. I thought so too, until I felt you'd rather be somewhere else. I wasn't the one who went to work yesterday, Saturday. A good distraction tactic is to shift the conversation to a single incident instead of staying on topic. Yes, I was the one who worked yesterday. You didn't say anything about doing something on Saturday together. Last Saturday, you went to your sister's house for the day. Then you and her had a late dinner during the week. That tells me you'd rather be with her. Honestly, that's fine. Maybe you could move in with her and Gordon. I know he'd want you around. That's disgusting. I don't like Gordon at all. Maybe you and Helen can buy imitators and batteries together and do each other without men. You don't understand. I sat down on the couch. I patted the seat next to me and said, sit here and explain it to me. I have a master's degree in science. Maybe I can understand if you tell me simply enough. Now you're being sarcastic. No, I want to understand. The only person I know who can help me understand is you. I can't think of anything on this planet or any other that would be as important to me as understanding it. I patted the couch again. She took a step closer to the couch and said, you can't understand women. Lisa, I don't care about understanding women at all. I want to understand you. I don't care why Helen stays with Gordon. I don't care why movie stars stay married or not. I don't care why other women do what they do. I care about you and I care about me. We saw the movie and for some reason it upset you. I don't want to live as a lesbian with my sister. I don't want to sell the house and kiss each other goodbye. She walked into the kitchen. I could hear the popcorn going into the trash can, the cans going down the garbage chute, and the bowl going into the dishwasher. She walked through the living room and into the bedroom. Twenty minutes later, she silently went to bed in my t-shirt and panties. I was already there, lying on my back. She turned off the light and turned on her side, turning away from me. I'll call the real estate agent in the morning. I rolled over onto my side and didn't say anything until morning. She didn't say anything either. When I got to work, I called a realtor I knew and pointed out our house. I had a long lunch and met her at the house. We put a good price on it. She explained to me what I had to do to raise the sale price and we parted after shaking hands. As I backed out of the driveway heading to work, I saw a for sale sign on the front lawn. Lisa leaves work a half hour earlier than me. I turned off my cell phone when she left work. Getting out of the car, I drove home, obeying all the rules of the road. As I turned onto our street, I saw a realtor's sign covered by a green plastic trash bag. I smiled. I parked in the garage, walked back into the yard, and removed the bag from the sign. I walked in the back door. Lisa was in our bedroom, face down on the bed. I walked into the bathroom, closed the door, and took a leak. I blushed, washed my hands, and opened the door. Lisa was sitting on the edge of the bed, on my side. I kept walking. When I got to the door, she said, I want to live with you. I don't believe you. I kept walking. In the kitchen, I got a Diet Coke and a small package of cookies. In the living room, I sat on the couch and turned on the news. I never watched the news. Lisa came in and sat on the other end of the couch. 
Two minutes passed with only noise coming from the TV. Can we talk? She asked. About what? I don't want to sell the house. I don't want to kiss you goodbye. Who do you want to kiss? I asked, turning to face her. I noticed her complexion change for a moment before she pulled herself together and said, No one. Okay, I'll leave it at that for now. Do you want to live with me? I'm your wife. Of course I want to live with you. You're not helping me understand you. You act like there's something wrong with me and maybe it's contagious. And then you tell me you want to stay. Am I treating you badly? You're not treating me badly. It's worse than that. You're not treating me badly at all. You don't want me to leave and you don't want me to be your husband. You could save us, but you can't bring yourself to do it. She sat and watched me get up off the couch and walk to our bedroom. I grabbed another pillow and blanket, carried them into the spare bedroom and threw them on the bed. I knew she knew what I was doing. I went back into the bedroom and closed the door behind me. I took a shower and went to bed. It wasn't even nine yet. At almost ten, Lisa opened the door and walked in. I usually sleep facing the door, so I saw her come in right away. She was naked. This was serious. In the dim light, her nakedness still lit the fires. She crept quietly to her side of the bed. She lifted the blanket and started to climb in. Stop. I turned on the lamp and turned to her. For a whole month, you've come to bed every night in your panties and a t-shirt. You sleep with your back turned away from me, and only once this month have I gotten a good night kiss. I put a pillow and an extra blanket in the other bedroom. You want to sleep in this house? Sleep there. I want to sleep with you. Tough. I made a mistake, but I have no idea what I did. I made a mistake with you. You know what the mistake was? You've been punishing me for it for a while. But you don't tell me what I did or didn't do. I'm left with only one choice. Sell the house, get a divorce, and let you be happy with someone else. I don't want to be happy with someone else. And you don't want to be happy with me. I give up. I correct my statement that I have only one choice left. Sell the house, get a divorce, and let you be unhappy with someone else. I got out of bed and turned on the overhead light. I looked at Lisa and asked, Do you love me? Up until the moment I asked, she was looking straight at me. The moment I asked her, she looked away for a second. I had an answer. In that moment, I realized that if we weren't married, if we hadn't committed to love, we would be having sex. She stood exactly as she had been standing since I said stop. I lifted the sheet and blanket and said, Get on the bed. I knew we had condoms in the other bedroom for our guests, so I went and got them. When I returned, she was lying on her back in bed. Her eyes looked scared. I tossed her the condom. You came to bed naked to convince me with sex to stay, not to sell the house and keep telling yourself you love me. Okay, here's your chance. We slept together. From the bathroom, I tossed her a box of tissues and took a shower to clean myself up. I turned off the light and got into bed. If you want, you can sleep here tonight. But first, you have to answer one question. I turned on the nightlight again, turned to her and asked, Will Bill pay for the hotel room tomorrow afternoon, or will you? Her eyes widened, and she burst into tears. She ducked her face into her pillow and continued to cry. I turned off the light and went to bed. About ten minutes after I turned off the light, Lisa got up and quietly walked out of the bedroom. She didn't come back. She remained silent. I did sleep, but it took a while to fall asleep. I met Helen for lunch. I could tell by the look on her face that Lisa hadn't spoken to her. We sat at the table farthest away from everyone. We ordered, grabbed our drinks, and knew it was still 20 minutes until lunch. Thanks for coming. I'm not going to throw Lisa a birthday party. But you said... I lied. I'd like to throw her a party, but I can't. Lisa's having an affair. I paused. There was a look of shock on Helen's face. Don't look shocked. It wasn't that long ago that she asked you to cover for her. Stay off the phone until I call your cell phone. I didn't know what she was doing. Oh, okay, let's say I believe you. Knowing that you now know that your married sister is walking around on the side, what are you going to do? Are you sure? I have video and audio. You want a copy? Oh, my God. I don't know what to do. 
She's meeting her lover at the hotel tonight. Her lover is my ex-best friend, Bill. I spent some time wondering why until I realized it doesn't matter. What matters is that she can't tell me she loves me. What matters is that damn Bill is more important than our marriage. A for sale sign hangs on the front lawn of our house. We're done. They brought us lunch, but we didn't eat a bite. I paid the bill and walked Helen to the car. I know what I'm going to do, since you asked. I don't have a sister anymore. She's behaving in a way that I don't want her in my family. And I'm going to talk to Gordon tonight. After talking to you, I can see that all is not well in my house either. She rose on tiptoe and kissed me on the cheek. I held the door open for her as she sat down. Can we stay in touch? You have my number. I nodded. She drove away. I went home and started moving Lisa's things around. First I moved her clothes into the other bedroom, then her dressing table. When I moved her dresser away from the wall, I found a large envelope between the dresser and the wall. Inside were pictures of her and Bill at a nudist resort. There was a DVD in the envelope as well. The envelope was mailed to us, and the return address was Bill's. Three houses down from us lives Miss Angela McGregor, an attorney. Her car was parked in the driveway of the house when I approached. I handed her a $100 bill. She took it and asked, What's the question? I think you can give me 15 minutes and that's enough time to figure out what my divorce will look like. I held out an envelope to her. She opened the envelope and looked inside without touching anything. She looked up and said, Let's talk. My hundred found me a lawyer. She wanted the case. She got the story and made some calls. One of the calls was addressed to Lisa's employer. She asked permission to speak to Lisa. She was told that Lisa had taken sick leave and gone home. Only Lisa wasn't home. I left the envelope with her. I went to the hardware store and bought a lock for the bedroom door. It was installed before Lisa got home. When she got home, I was sitting at the table. She came to the door and asked if I wanted dinner. No, I think I'm safer eating outside the house, but thanks for the offer. Did you have a fun day? I'm over it. May I ask why? Obviously you are planning on banging him tonight. Why stop? I want to be married to you. Bullshit. You don't even love me. You'd rather fuck my best friend than be faithful to me. I was thinking about revenge. I thought about printing a thousand copies of the pictures of you having fun, but I realized a kid could see them and it would be disgusting. No, the best thing would be to sell the house, split the money, and let you be miserable. She burst into tears and ran down the hall. She stopped at the bedroom door and saw the new lock. It's locked, she said. She didn't say that to me. She just said it. All your stuff is in the other bedroom. You moved while you were with Bill. I heard the door to the other bedroom close and never saw her again that night. Wednesday at work, Louis asked why I missed yesterday. I had started a lawsuit with my soon-to-be ex-wife. I wonder if we talked about it last week. Stop guessing. I got her. We're done. End of story. As we sat at lunch, my cell phone rang. She was served. Ten minutes later, the phone rang again. I looked up, expecting it to be Lisa. It was Helen. He'd already been served, she said. Do you want to get some dinner and lick your wounds? No. I want to hide somewhere and cry over wasted years. I think our lawyers would advise us to stay away from each other, at least until the divorces are final. Mine says we'll be free on Thanksgiving. Let's go on a cruise for Christmas, she laughed. Are you serious? You have six months to make a decision. Until then, take care of yourself. Gordon took the news hard. The day after he was served, he took all the cash the ATM gave him and stopped at a convenience store where he bought enough Jack Daniels to give him and his three new friends alcohol poisoning. He made it to the hospital alive. He didn't live to see the divorce and left Helen a widow three days before their anniversary. The day Lisa was served, she called Helen at work. Someone answered and then called out to Helen. Helen, it's your sister calling. It can't be, Helen said. I don't have a sister. I used to have one, but she died. The lady who answered hung up. That same day, Miss McGregor arranged for a private investigator to visit the place where Bill worked. He showed the pictures to the CEO and left him a copy. They found a way to let Bill leave the company with no severance pay, no nothing. Once out of the office, he never returned to his tiny apartment. No one had seen him since, well, 
No one here, anyway. Lisa signed the papers when they were presented. They guaranteed her 20% of the sale of the house. On November 10th, I was single. I sold the house in July and lived in the Airstream trailer we bought for the vacations until I decided what to do next. Lisa hadn't contacted me about the money from the sale of the house. At 8 o'clock in the evening, someone knocked on my door. I opened the door. Helen was standing there wearing high heels, stockings, a short skirt, and jacket. She looked at me and said, I'm looking for a single man, mid-forties, divorced and not objecting to the society of a widow. Maybe I know him. Why don't you come inside and I'll help you find him? Is it warm in there? Warm. It could get even hotter. My hand helped her up the steps, and she stood in the middle of my little living room, dining room and kitchen, waiting for me to help her take off her jacket. And I took it off and found that she wasn't wearing a blouse or bra. I waited, as you said, until you were alone. Now do me a favor. Let's go to bed and let's work something out. Right there in the tiny Airstream trailer, Helen and I had our first kiss. We had known each other for over 15 years and we were ready to start something. When the kiss ended, I waved my hand, pointing seven feet from where she was to the bedroom. Taking a second step in that direction, she opened the refrigerator. In three seconds, she took a complete inventory of the contents. She stepped back, took out a jacket and put it on. She took my hand and said, let's go. We're going to my house. I have everything we could possibly need. She was right. 